The Smithsonian Faculty Fellowship Program represents a rewarding academic professional development opportunity for faculty at Montgomery College. The fellowships are a product of a unique collaboration between Montgomery College and Smithsonian Center for Education and Museum Studies. It's the first of its kind between the Smithsonian Institution and a community college. Antonio del Castillo Olivares is a professor of biology at Montgomery College, where he teaches principles of biology, genetics, and chemistry. He has a background in scientific research and has published his work on fields like cholesterol metabolism, transcription factors, and the relation of cancer and oxidative stress. In his current position, he has created a course, Scientific Research, SC 297, and established a program of undergraduate research at Montgomery College. He is also a co-principal investigator in a STEP NSF grant funded with $1.8 million and focused to increase the recruit, retention, and graduation of high school students in STEM disciplines. Antonio is a native of Spain. His passion for education and interest in biology inspired him to obtain a certificate in education from the University of Malaga, Spain. In Malaga, he also attained his Bachelor's in Biology in 1991, as well as a Master in Sciences in 1992, and a doctoral degree in 1995. He is the first in his family to migrate to the U.S. and uses his personal story to encourage high school and college students to pursue a career in science. And I remember it was more than a year ago, back in September or something like that, when I read about the call for uh, applications to this fellowship, and I read that the theme was forging America's identity, the critical encounters, and cross-cultural exchanges. And I just loved the title. I thought it was very personal to me, and I thought that I, I felt the need to apply. But after that, my question was, how can I make my biology curriculum fit into that theme? And um, I went home, and I talked to my wife, and I told her, look, this is, this is, there is this great opportunity at Montgomery College. I really want to apply, but I have no idea how can I study uh, whether biology has been an item into developing America's identity. And my wife told me, why don't you precisely study that? <laughs> <laughs> That's the question right there that you have to develop in your application. Has biology played a role in forging American identity? I look at her and say, okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So I started reading searching for information, preparing the application. I came, when, during my process of searching, I came um, to this book prepared by Bern Dibner, where he put together 200 heralds of science, and one of them was uh, the book De Novum Organum by Francis Bacon. And in there, he says that Francis Bacon uh, um, Sensing the bold spirit of the age, picture science as a ship venturing beyond the pillars of Hercules, the limits of the old world. And I thought that picture right there is precisely how I feel about the theme and how it, it's personal to me. Because I am from Spain, I'm coming from the old world, and I came to America, the new world, and I'm a scientist. Is this changing me? Is this changing? Or people in the past that have done the same, has that play a role in America's identity? I thought that that was very powerful. Also, the pillars of Hercules. The pillars of Hercules are Gibraltar and the northern tip of Africa, which is precisely where I came from, from the south of Spain. So I thought it was very, a very good representation of, of what I wanted. And um, so I decided to jump in 
and make an exhibition of this work. I ask my students, I want you to show me things that demonstrate that biology has played a role in America's identity. And we are going, at the end of the semester, we are going to prepare an exhibition and we are going to show it to all the faculties. And when I told them that, they look at me and they were like, oh no, please, don't, don't make us do this. But I said, yes, we are going to do this. Uh, and they did, and they did a very good work, I have to say. I'm very proud of all of them. Um, let me explain you a little bit of the methodology that I follow for that. I don't want to scare you on the, on the right part, that's the syllabus, is the, I mean the schedule, irrelevant. That's why I put everything in purple, and I highlighted in yellow the days that we did something related to the Smithsonian project. And it all starts with where I think everything has to start, which is with the visit to the library and doing informative uh, um, literature, right? Research. And that's the very first thing I do with my students. I take them to the library. We have one librarian here with us. And I said, thank you very much for all your help. <laughs> uh, I took my class there and they teach them, they tell them the opportunities that the libraries have for them and how to do proper searches. So with that in mind, I then asked them to do library searches related to the subject that we want to study. And then they ask them to write a paper about that subject. What I'm looking forward is to prepare them to the visit for the museum because a visit to the museum, as we have discussed in our meetings, changes when you walk into a museum having studied what you want to look into the museum is different than if you just step into the museum. Somebody will talk more about it, I'm sure. Um, then we have to go finally to the museum. We, we had to go there, I go with them. If they cannot make it that day, they had to go on their own. You know, that's how it works. That's a picture of some of us in front of that picture from uh, George Washington Carver in the National Portrait Gallery. Now, one thing I make a personal point was I didn't want to take my students to the natural science history. I wanted to take my students to other museums. And I make a point to go to the National Portrait Gallery, and we went also to the American History Museum. And we then up something later, which was a visit to the United States Botanical Garden, which is next door, and it was a wonderful idea. So I prepared the visit to the museum as a game, a hunting game, a treasure hunting game. And um, that's another picture. That was at the beginning of the trip. The previous picture was at the end of the trip when we were all really tired. <laughs> that's why we were all sitting. <laughs> we all enjoyed the whole thing. Uh, but how was the game, the treasure hunting game? It all starts with this picture that I discovered in one of my trips to the National Portrait Gallery. That's called The Men of Progress. It's a painting by Christian Schussel. And um, it shows 20 of the most prominent inventors, American inventors. And each one of those inventions have mark the history of the United States. And I said 20 and not 19 because on the top left corner we have Benjamin Franklin, right? And one of the many things I have learned in my talks is that whenever there is a picture of somebody inside of a picture, that demonstrates or is showing somebody of relevance, right? And I thank you very much, Vidya, for, for teaching me that. And you see Benjamin Franklin there in a higher position looking to the rest of the scientists. 
And I start my trip with one of those scientists, which is marked with that label, William Thomas Green Morton. In that picture, right in front of him, is also Samuel Colt, the inventor of the Colt. Yes? Uh, actually, you cannot see it very well, but the Colt is right there. It's in, in that little table by his side. Now, one of the interesting things and I learned this from my students when they were doing their search, is that Colt, Samuel Colt, went from town to town, to fair, from fair to fair, to different fairs, and um, to show their revolvers and things. But to get money, there were the opportunity to uh, inhale nitric oxide, the laughing gas. And Morton, Green Morton, was following him, and he noticed how some of the clients inhale too much nitric oxide, and they start laughing, and then they drop on the floor, <laughs> and they didn't have any pain when they wake up. And Morton, he was a dentist, and he said, hmm, I think I can use this for my practice. And that's what drives him to invent a machine to, uh, to treat patients with, with anesthesia. And he also developed new anesthetics, different to nitric oxide. Uh, I learned all that from them. The students doing the search found these things, and they came back to me, and they told me all these wonderful things. That started with just the beginning of that. The machine, the anesthesia inhaler, it just happens to be also at the Smithsonian Museum. It's at the American History Smithsonian Museum. So you see, we start in the National Portrait Gallery, and then we can go to the American history, and there is science all over the place. Another wonderful thing that you can find, and my students found in that museum, in the American History Museum, is, for example, a vial of one of the first uh, polio vaccines. They did put all these findings later on in their posters, in their exhibition. Now, while we were in the American History Museum, one of the most powerful objects that everybody felt, and it's like, like, a, like a magnet, is that couple of the small um, shackles, which were used or were wear by a little girl, an African American. The American History Museum has donated a little bit of space to the new African American History Museum, which will be open in a few years. In the meantime, they are showing some exhibitions, uh, small exhibitions, and that object were found by my students there. And that made them start asking questions about the exchange between the Europe and Africa and America. And I was able to talk to them then about the concept of homogenosine, which we have all talked about quite a lot because we read this wonderful book, 1493, right? Um, so they love that concept and they love that, uh, they love that idea. I believe that some of my students even bought the book and they start reading it. And because of that homogenosine, they discovered that it was the exchange of people, the exchange of animals, the exchange of plants, the exchange of diseases, both ways. And that caused a humongous change, economical and sociological which was precisely what we are talking about. Um, some of the items that they found that there was a change was the, the sugar cane, for example. And the sugar cane is interesting. The sugar cane is a plant that came originally from India, moved from, to Europe, and then we took it to the Caribbean. The sugar, plant, sugar cane plants are very difficult to grow, and it, it requires a lot of labor. The original workers were the Native Americans. 
we all know what happened, everybody was killed. New labor was needed. And they brought that labor from Africa. That was the driving force for slavery. We sent to Africa foods like corn and potatoes, which has much more energy. Out of a pound of sugar, you get an amount of energy. Out of a pound of starch, you get much more energy. In Africa, if you have a family growing <coughs> potatoes or corn instead of sugar, they do have more energy. They are going to produce more offsprings. And that's more labor that is coming to the uh, United States. That was almost evil, diabolic plan that fit the slavery trade. All that was discovered by the students while working on this. I talk about the exchange of diseases. Malaria was one of them. And also the plants that are used to treat malaria. Now, some of the most important, one of the most important plants used to treat malaria is quinone. And quinone, the plant quinone, happens to be at the United States Botanical Garden. And that's why we did a trip over there and they had over there not just quinone, but many other plants that were, treat, that were used in Europe to treat malaria that we brought over here. So you see, all this is an adventure trip where the students are discovering station after station. And then it was the moment of going back together and bring everything to the classroom and start working on the exhibition itself. And they developed these posters. They came up with their own groups and their own ideas. I'll just try to guide them a little bit. Some of them make posters regarding the, the the first painting, the Men of Progress. The students came with this idea that also one of my colleagues here came, which is, was, why don't we make a collage, not just about Men of Progress, but about Women of Progress? Because one of the characteristics of the, of the first painting is that all of them are white male. There was no woman, and there were no people from other um, ethnicities. And they came up with this whole list of females, Hispanic, uh, Asian, and so on. They also did posters about the homogenousing, and you can see how they just have fun. <laughs> uh, that one, that student over there, he's from Korea, and that's his personal custom of Cristóbal Colón. Cristo <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I always thought that that was very funny. Some of them did a poster on malaria, posters on malaria. And I have put here some of the things that they said about the work. I chose that picture of that student because also he chose to share something personal with us. And I love that picture. This picture was taken by Grace here, uh, a photographer, and I just love that picture. He was telling us that he chose malaria because he had sickle cell anemia. And that it was, for him, eye-opening to find out that by having sickle cell anemia, he was better protected against malaria. malaria. And um, for, them, for him, that was personal. And he chose to, to share that with us, which I really appreciate. Some others did work on chemistry. The painting, remember the first painting about George Washington Carver, very interesting American figure. He was from the South, he was born a slave, he got to college, he got a, PA, a, a doctor, an MD degree, and he changed the economy in the South States. The soil was completely burned and because of cotton, harvesting, there was no nutrients in the, in the soil. And he discovered that by changing to peanuts, the nutrients that the, soil were, um, that the soil lost because of the cotton, those nutrients were going to go back into the soil. So he needed to convince all the 
farmers in the south changed from cotton to peanuts. But the farmers in the south were not uh, very happy about it because there was no economic relevance like today. He had to invent more than 300 uses for peanuts. <laughs> Peanut oil, anything with peanuts, we owe to George Washington Carver. It was so important, it changed the economy on the South that he was invited to talk in front of the Congress. It was the first American slave and then free person that spoke in the Congress. And then they did some work on AIDS, HIV, and they mentioned how some of the students thought that HIV, the, the existence of HIV, had changed the society view on uh, subjects like homosexuality, and it's, it's very related to our previous speaker and all these identity things. So it was very interesting. What do I believe that the students achieve with this work? I think that we have included in our curriculum, thanks to the trips to the Smithsonian, information literacy. Critical thinking, critical thinking is not anymore an empty word. Critical thinking has a meaning now. Critical thinking doesn't mean anything if we really put it in the curriculum. Writing and oral expressions, that's also important. And uh, I demonstrate the students that we can start a scientific trip on a National Portrait Museum or a History Museum that brings together science and humanities. Today, the college is all talking about learning communities. And they talk about multidisciplinary learning communities when we try to mix biology with chemistry. But now there is this new lingo that they are using, which is the transdisciplinary learning communities, where we build bridges between science and humanities. I would like to finish with an answer to those people that ask, what can science get from humanities? I will say, first of all, scientists use the scientific method. The scientific method is philosophy. There is nothing more belonging to humanities than philosophy. And I will also remind them that the Socratic method as we can learn in the Socratic dialogues, follow uh, this example. You can read one which is the second story of Meno. It's not by Plato, it's by a different unknown writer. But in that one, Socrates teaches a boy that doesn't know any math that the root of two is an irrational number. That will be my answer to what can humanities bring to science. Thank you very much.